I almost didn't engage with it for a while because it felt like it couldn't, I couldn't be a cancer patient at 26. I was so young um, and that it was something that I may, I may not be able to have children. Because I had an aggressive form of cervical cancer, uh, the best option was to cut my uterus in half. So it was just surreal to be able to have a baby despite the odds. My story was lucky um, that it was picked up at a pap smear, but I went quite regularly for these, so I was pretty on top of getting these done, so yeah. On the back of the conventional pap smear, Australia now has a very low incidence of mortality, but Victoria is approaching what will be possibly elimination targets. So based on our old program, we're at 4.8 per 100,000, with a mortality of about one per 100,000, which is absolutely world leading. And what that tells you is that with the right systems and processes, you can achieve very good control of cervical cancer. The pap smear screening program in Australia has been very successful indeed, but we're now moving to a newer technology that directly tests for the presence of the human papillomavirus, or HPV, which of course, because it causes cervical cancer, has led directly to the development of a vaccine and directly to HPV as a better screening test for cervical cancer. To truly eradicate cervical cancer, which is treatable and preventable, it will be some formulation of the HPV vaccine, which should play a big role in conjunction with diagnostics. So diagnostics would include the pap test and the detection of the virus through the HPV test. The real challenge is to deliver these innovations where they need it the most, to help protect against the 600,000 cases happening every year, predominantly in low and middle income countries. Just imagine that a patient who is just 25 years old got married recently, has not given birth at all, then all of a sudden presents with bleeding, and you know the patient is going to die. You are trained to save lives, but here's the case, most of your patients are dying within six months. Screening in Asia for cervical cancer is available, and yet we still see a high burden of advanced uh, diseases. When women get diagnosed with cervical cancer here, most often it's um, stage 3 or stage 4 cervical cancer. So in terms of clinical outcomes, they don't do as well as they should if they have been diagnosed earlier. To be honest, I'm very reluctant to go for the normal, regular pap smear test because I feel a bit like uncomfortable and I feel a bit shy. After I give birth, doctor gave me a letter to do pap smear, but I never go to do the pap smear because a lot of people, they said, you will feel pain when they do the pap smear. When I first uh, concerned about uh, my problems, uh, I have bleeding after sex. So I went for some uh, doctor checkup uh, and uh, found out that I have cancer. And it considers stage three or four, yeah. When I came here, when I did the pap smear, the doctor said she will inform me, she will call me after a week, she called me and she informed me that I'm diagnosed with the cervical cancer stage 2B. As of 2011, through the National Mobility and Healthcare Survey in Malaysia, you only get less than 13% of eligible women who have been screened. 13. So I, I think we have to ramp up and increase the numbers, especially from the lower income group. Women who feel shy, women who feel um, I'm too busy taking care of my kids, uh, making ends meet, they don't really focus on themselves, on, on their health. So, uh Pap smear, a conventional pap smear, requires quite an uncomfortable pelvic examination and that's why women don't like having this test done. So to remove that 
aspect of the discomfort, what we've done is we've now used self-sampling. And this is really through the knowledge sharing by our friends in Australia who have validated this method. And there's now enough evidence globally to show that a self-swap done by a woman can be as good as a clinician-acquired swap. So imagine you've transformed something that's so invasive to a simple test where women can do this test in their own privacy, taking their own time. We cannot waste a second longer. We have to dispense this program nationwide and we have to make sure that every agency, because you know, there's going to be uh, some degree of inertia. I love my pap smears, said no woman ever. Yeah, but you, you need to understand then that it's not about you, right? It's not about, okay, I fixed my budget for this year. It's about what works for that woman that you're targeting. And if we don't speed things up, lives are at stake. This sickness is really impact my life, my career, my family, and, and that is why pap smear and vaccination is really important. Yeah. I don't wish to have any woman to experience what I have experienced or the experience. Make sure you go and do the pap smear and tell to the doctor your feelings, you're scared or whatever, they will help you out. If we can achieve successful scale-up of HPV and cervical screening and vaccination, the estimates that we've done here at Cancer Council New South Wales suggest that we could prevent up to 13 million cervical cancer cases in the next 50 years. To me, vaccination is a gift to your child. And as someone that now has a child, if I can give the gift of a cancer-free life to my child in any way, I'm going to do everything that I can to avoid my child having to go through what I did. We're delivering vaccines to young pre-adolescents. The peak age of risk is in the 40s and 50s and beyond, so it will take time to have an effect. In the meantime, cervical screening has an incredibly important role to protect the hundreds of millions of women who are already exposed to HPV and who are already at risk globally. We're losing a woman every two minutes, and this should not happen, especially when we have all the weapons we need to fight it. We have the vaccines, we have the diagnostics, and we have the treatment. When we have all the weapons at hand, failure should not be an option.